Sir, are we uh, live? Yeah. Uh, can, we can start. All right, sir. Good afternoon, students. Uh, uh, hopefully, your day is being well so far, and uh, I understand that this is your second lecture in this week, um, environmental studies. But trust me, this will be a great lecture. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Karyam Pallil V. George. He is a senior principal scientist at National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, known as NIRI, Nagpur. And uh, <clears throat> he has almost 30 years of experience in this field, this environmental science and engineering. His specialty is on uh, air control and uh, water control technologies. Uh, he completed his uh, bachelor's of engineering in civil and master's of engineering in environmental engineering and a PhD from IIT Delhi. He has over 30 projects and several publications. So currently he is head of the air pollution control division at NIRI. Uh, with his immense experience of research as well as teaching, I'm pretty sure you are going to enjoy this lecture and definitely you will learn a lot. So please, Sabil sir, please proceed with that one. And Professor George, please, the class is yours. Thank you. Uh, how can I upload uh, upload this? Should I go th to that upload? Uh, Sh share the slides directly. Uh, yes, yes, you can. Please sir, share the slide. So your slides are visible. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes. No, is it in? Slides show mode right now. Yes, it's in slide show mode. You can read the. Slides clearly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, so let me start without wasting time. Uh, today I'll be talking to on the subject introduction to air pollution and uh, uh, let me uh, put a few points that is. Uh, the subject air pollution when if wherever you learn the first part you should know is what is air not pollution pollution comes next so first we will understand air today the entire topic is only air pollution is the last uh, few slides uh, so i'll start with air and when we talk of air we need to understand what is earth so whatever I'm going to talk is all your 9th, 10th, 11th standard general knowledge, but it is structured in a way that uh, you will link everything in a sequence. Now, what we are going to do today is uh, let's understand what is our atmosphere. So few points that we should know is how Earth was formed, evolution of atmosphere, seasons and winds. These things are very important and how it is related, relevant, I'll come to tell you. You must have studied a lot of uh, molecular weight of a lot of uh, elements in periodic table. But then what is the molecular weight of air and why we should know this? How much wet air is heavier than dry air? You write down this question, all students, and by the time I reach uh, some 15 slides, you should be able to answer this. How much wet air is heavier than dry air? Then the last issue will be how air got polluted. Okay, so the, here I'm talking about how Earth was formed. So uh, Big Bang Theory, everyone has heard it. Some uh, of the, uh, the stu curious students must have read it. And uh, so I'm bringing it once again. The entire universe was compact into a tiny, tiny little ball 
some 10 to 20 billion years ago, a cosmic explosion hurled space, time, matter, energy in an instant in, in all directions. There's some disturbance. Yeah. Okay. Now, the question that arises is, what made all these things to happen? The, why Big Bang happened? And why this question is important because there are two schools of thought. One school of thought says it is a God who created this universe and Earth. And other, another school of thought is there is it's, there a, a scientific reasoning behind all these things. That's why the Big Bang theory is questioned. The reasons for this Big Bang theory. Now, scientifically, Big Bang theory was proved in 1964 by two scientists, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. And they won the Nobel Prize. Now, what, how they discovered it? What they found is 20, 10 to 20 billion years ago, when the cosmic explosion took place, the light that emitted, that reached Earth now. So it is the, that is the distance it, that light has traveled and reached uh, Earth's surface, which we have seen, observed, monitored, and therefore Big Bang is true. That was that's what these two scientists have explained. Now, once the uh, this explosion took place, uh, one small piece in the universe today, which we call Earth, is moving ar was moving around initially into a red hot ball. It was uh, getting cooled down. Now you can see symbolically it is shown a cooling of Earth. Okay, then finally, this is the Earth which we see from satellite. Now, when this initial Earth was uh, getting cooled down, at that time, what was the atmosphere of composition of atmosphere at that time? So it is. Uh, we can say helium, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, dust. Now the question that you should come into your mind, why this is not containing oxygen? That's the first question. Because the temperature was very high and oxygen reacts with everything in our, around. All elements and there was, four, there was no free oxygen. And these are the gas, gases. Now if these were the gases, why they are not available today in our atmosphere. So hydrogen, you will see it here. This hydrogen and helium, they are uh, in the periodic table having lowest uh, molecular weight. So they might have escaped or Earth's gravity is not able to hold them because they are too light. Now again, the origin of universe, I'm starting with, Someone made the universe. The two schools of thought is here. Someone made the universe. It's an intelligent design of God. And the other school is universe made itself by a random chance. So for uh, the second answer, it is the second school of thought, the Big Bang theory that is proving it. But who started the bang, which is subsequently the ecosystem, everything was explained by Darwin's evolution theory. So that's how one school of thought which says universe made itself, then there was a beginning of life through simple ancestors, and then today we are here. So question posed by those who believe in God, they says who created this simple ancestor? Was it God? Or again it is a chance? Now, <clears throat> so in this context we must know a few scientists in this field because uh, it will keep our interest alive. Darwin, Charles, Sir Charles Darwin, his name is there, okay? His uh, life is 1809 to 1882. All of you must have heard of a movie, Tom, Dick and Harry. I think Ritesh Deshmukh was a uh, character in that movie. Now, you should think, the curiosity should come into you from where these three words have come, Tom, Dick and Harry. Actually, these were, were the names given by Charles Darwin to three tortoises which he picked up from Galapagos Island in 1835 when he went on a tour. He 
preserved those three turtles and uh, one of them is still alive which is shown here in the lower photograph its age must be something 180 years or more than that now it is where it is it's in australia's steve irwin's australian zoo now steve irwin if you want to recall he is no more he was an outstanding naturalist who used to catch uh, crocodiles uh, in, the, in the discovery channel was full of him steve irwin uh, in one of the stingrays attack he died unfortunately uh, so in the, he is having a uh, he maintained a zoo called steve irwin's zoo in australia one of the turtle is still alive uh, which was picked up by the by charles darwin now this is the darwin's theory of evolution life on earth arose from non living matter now here the conflict is from non living to living matter is it god or chance okay by way of some unknown unconscious mechanistic natural process and then proceeded to evolve to make more complex life forms etc etc and this is how uh, the darwin's model is exhibited here we comes the first living matter they say is some blue green algae we just read it it is having some genetic code then now those who make mockery of darwin's theory they say from this onwards finally charles darwin from ape man to darwin man it has come today we find his photograph in suit but this is the journey of darwin this is what uh, those who make mockery of uh, darwin's theory they create now now let us so now what i have shown so far is there was an explosion earth was formed it was cooled down then uh, 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 people started living but before that atmosphere should be there so let's make the atmosphere first e evolution of the atmosphere what is atmosphere it's an envelope ga of gases that surrounds the earth and atmosphere has no outer boundary it just fades into space so uh, more close to the earth surface more dense is the atmosphere now there is first atmosphere second atmosphere first is probably hydrogen and helium which i said in the beginning these gases were lost to space because earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold them they are lighter gases in the periodic table you can see top right corner then second atmosphere when earth was getting cooled down the inside of the earth which was having hot molten magma it was releasing its energy by way of volcanic eruptions so volcanic gases contain all these mentioned gases but there was no free oxygen and when earth cooled down the water vapor condensed and formed the when it got filled up in the depressions it became ocean so that is how our atmosphere is uh, initial first and second atmosphere formed but there was no oxygen now let's add oxygen into our atmosphere uh, try, let's understand how it came there are two phenomena first is photochemical dissociation this needs to be understood very clearly because this will help you understand how ozone layer was formed initially there was no ozone layer it was only that second atmosphere where there was no free oxygen now because of the absence of ozone layer the radiation from sun was able to reach the earth's surface which contained water in its ocean so that radiation where the lambda is less than 310 nanometer or you should say it is <coughs> in the uh, ultraviolet range that reached the earth surface it broke up h2o molecule and then it released oxygen this oxygen was also getting broken down into nascent oxygen atoms again that was for uh, reacting so there was a dynamic reaction leading to formation of ozone now this ozone was very close to the earth surface Yeah, this ozone is having characteristics of 
inhibiting entry of radiation which is having short wave radiation so what was happening the ozone layer started building up at the surface of the earth gradually the concentration of ozone layer was getting increased and a time came when ozone was not allowing entry of short wave radiation into the earth surface so then the formation of oxygen at the surface by this photochemical dissociation ceased it was only at the outer layer of the ozone layer and gradually it started increasing building up and today ozone is from 25 km to 50 km vertical depth in the atmosphere remember from the surface of the earth up to 25 km ozone is not from found from 25 to 50 that is the patch where ozone is distributed and when we talk of ozone hole if ozone is missing in that region the concentration is getting down the radi short wave radiation is will be able to penetrate to ground surface level and it will create havoc and one of the example is skin cancer now that is the first process of photochemical dissociation the other process is photosynthesis now photosynthesis is a process where life has entered life form is a must what has happened the blue green algae has come into existence as stated by the scientific community now, what it does it uses consumes carbon dioxide water in the presence of sunlight and converts into more organic compound and releases oxygen which we experience today as plants so plant what it is doing it is accepting it is converting co2 and h2 into oxygen and in the presence of sunlight if every time there is uh, darkness the plants will not grow now gradually we will, the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere started building up and today we have significant amount of oxygen about 21% which is helpful in the survival of life so here in this curve you can see gradually how the oxygen concentration started uh, built up and we have reached today's atmosphere now when i said air pollution it is air plus pollution again we will visit about air and atmosphere earth we learn it as crust mantel core now we are analyzing it we are dividing it into different parts the earth is divided from academic point of view this is very important the three great spheres it is called atmosphere lithosphere and hydrosphere so all water component is hydrosphere all solid earth surface is lithosphere and above this is gaseous part is atmosphere the study of anything on the land is terrestrial ecosystem the study part and anything on the ocean part is aquatic or not only ocean large lakes or river system we call it aquatic ecosystem this are, these are the classification another way of classification is physical environment and biological environment so when in future when you go to higher classes you should be able to place which component you are studying with are you uh, if you talk of atmosphere you mostly study physical environment but if you talk of botany we are going towards biological environment okay now there is interaction among these different uh, spheres also that's why it becomes interdisciplinary let's go ahead <coughs> what is the thickness of atmosphere united states environmental protection agency has defined or it, they have given this diagram this is at compared to the size of the earth the thickness of atmosphere is just like the size of an apple and its skin this apple is not apple phone this is real fruit okay now we have reached our planet okay let's move ahead let's think of the composition of air from here onwards we need to be little cautious because now numbers are coming which we needs to uh, understand if not remembering it 
Now read this table carefully. Component is nitrogen, oxygen, and argon followed by carbon dioxide. So this is what I have written as the four initial gases in the atmosphere, uh, dry air composition. Now you see the volume 78 percent. If we approximate it, nitrogen is 78 percent, oxygen is 21 percent, argon. 0.934 percent carbon dioxide 0.033. Now today you you must have heard of lot about greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide built up, carbon sequestration. What all these things they talk? They talk of reducing this carbon dioxide level. How much it is? 0.033. But this itself is sufficient enough to raise the temperature of the atmosphere. Imagine a situation where carbon dioxide, you remove entire carbon dioxide from atmosphere, what will happen? The temperature of Earth will come down by about 18 degrees Celsius. So the temperature of Earth is maintained by this carbon dioxide, but if you increase it further, it will increase the overall temperature, then subsequent melting of glacier, ice and all those problems. Now you see the molecular weight, this is nothing new in this. Now this is the full composition. So remaining gases are uh, mostly inert. If you see the last column of the periodic table, it's uh, present in a very small quantity. So what is important is, in, if you remember only the first two, that is sufficient. Now one of the questions which I raised in the beginning, what is the molecular weight of air? And the, uh, why you should know this? Why? Because this will help you understand few more phenomena in the atmosphere. So here is the, uh, I've given now approximate nitrogen 78.1%, oxygen 20.9, argon 0.9, their respective molecular weight. Now how to find the molecular weight? Here is the way. You can find the fractional weight of these gases. Proportional weight, you can say. You simply multiply 78.1 into 28 divided by 100 because 78.1 is the percent. So you multiply, you will get 21.9. So this way you multiply this row. Finally, you add it. What you get is the molecular weight of air, which is 28.9. This is number you should remember. Molecular molecular weight of dry air. Remember this is dry air, there is no moisture. It is 28.9. Now why we are studying this? Here is another question. Okay. My question is how much wet air is heavier than dry air? Now I believe you must have given some thought on this line. Let us try to understand through some Similarity study, similarity approach. One of the similarity approaches, if we keep take a dry handkerchief and dip it into water and then weigh it, what we will find? The weight is increased because it has absorbed moisture. Now this gives us a perception or some idea about how much is the wet handkerchief is heavier than dry handkerchief. But when we talk of air, how we should think? Now see the two lines which I have mentioned. Why the announcements of railway station, and I have written it wrong, bus stand, it's actually bus stand, is clearly uh, audible in early morning. Have any one of you noticed? I noticed it. About 4.30 or 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning, <clears throat> you can clearly, I can clear in my city, hear the announcement in the railway station, some, some uh, lady saying that so-and-so train is approaching the platform and or this is delayed and we regret as usual, we, every time we hear from railways, uh, they apologize. But why is it that they, in the 24-hour cycle, we hear this only at early morning time, uh, just before sunrise. Once sunrise takes place, the voice is gone, whereas announcement continues in the uh, railway platform. So this is something, an observation 
you should <clears throat> and as an environmental uh, students of environment science and engineering observation is a must here now second example why golf players find it difficult to hit for longer distance during dry season once again i am reading it or explaining it if the season is dry dry means there is less moisture in the atmosphere if the ball is hit it will go go to a shorter distance whereas suppose if it rained and the goal, golf ball is hit it will go to a farther distance this is the experience of golfers now how these two uh, how we will interpret these things here is another example sir isaac newton stated in 1770 <coughs> that dry air is heavier than wet air <coughs> my question at the top you can read how much wet air is heavier than dry air my question was in the negative direction the truth is dry air is actually heavier than wet air and it was stated by sir isaac newton in 1770 at that time sir isaac newton was not aware of the composition of air the composition of air we understood very recently 1870s more than 150 years after sir isaac newton we have understood the uh, composition of air dry air it means you imagine how sir isaac newton used to think he had some observations based on which he said it and two observations i am keep presenting before you the golf ball and railway station's announcement to a farther distance the composition of atmosphere which contains nitrogen and oxygen nitrogen was discovered by daniel rutherford in 1772 Ox oxygen was discovered by carl wilhelm schiele in 1773 in a place of pasla and at the same time joseph priestley in will share in 1774 so you can see there is a time gap of 150 years <clears throat> more than that the atmospheric composition and the weight of air uh, they came to know uh, the scientific community came to know now how you will prove that dry air is heavier by computation let me explain to it i said in the last slide the dry air is having a molecular weight of 28.9 now suppose from a dry air parcel a cubicle you remove a small part of dry air and fill equivalent moisture equivalent means moisture of the same volume moisture is h2o what is the molecular weight of h2o hydrogen 2 oxygen 16 16 plus 2 18 so what we are doing now we are replacing 28.9 uh, gram with 18 gram so can you sense the difference if the air is dry its molecular weight is 28.9 and you are if you want to make it wet you have to remove a part of the dry air and fill moisture into it moisture is having molecular weight of 18 which is less than this and therefore dry air is heavier than wet air stated by sir isaac newton was correct and it is evident by these methods these two examples now why we should study this because one more question will come in future how deserts are formed they are related to this phenomena let me go gradually towards it a few more phenomena in the atmosphere of the atmosphere that we need to know to understand how deserts are formed how rainfall takes place so here <clears throat> wet or moist dry air parcel let's understand when we talk of air parcel means you can imagine a box an imaginary cubical box and which is having a fixed volume 
weight may change but uh, temperature pressure everything may change but it's having a fixed volume now the statement a air parcel of fixed volume can hold a definite maximum moisture at a given temperature and pressure let's re read this sentence imagine a air parcel at some temperature say 30 degree celsius is the temperature of that air parcel now at 30 degree celsius it will <coughs> retain some moisture maximum moisture that is fixed if you change the temperature the moisture holding capacity will change it means the moisture holding capacity of an air parcel is a function of its temperature so the next statement is if the air is saturated it is holding maximum moisture at that temperature <coughs> and at that time we state that its relative humidity is 100% whenever you uh, refer to the weather charts or the new information given by the weatherman in television you will always find the mention about temperature and uh, humidity so if humidity is 100% means at that temperature it has hold maximum amount of moisture no more moisture can be added to that air parcel if you add it it will condense as rain or precipitation now here i am trying to explain it using some uh, pictures suppose that this air parcel is having a temperature t1 and it is saturated so its relative humidity is 100% maximum moisture we have fed into it any more moisture if you feed into this it will fall down <coughs> or it will precipitate as rain so this is an uh, air parcel in the atmosphere we take another atmosphere or the same air parcel what you do you increase the temperature of the same air parcel and bring it from t1 to t2 now what will happen its relative humidity will become less than 100% you have not changed the moisture content suppose it contains x grams of moisture it is having x grams of moisture but relative humidity has come down it means its capacity to hold moisture is increased you can feed more moisture into the air parcel of higher temperature let's see another parcel same our air parcel if you bring it to a temperature of say <coughs> t3 okay now just a minute let me have a glass of water <coughs> now this <coughs> third air parcel it's not third air no same air parcel you have reduced its temperature from t1 to t3 you have now reduced the temperature what will happen its moisture holding capacity will come down because temperature has come down if the temperature is low of the air parcel if it is low its moisture holding capacity is also low so what will happen now relative humidity has gone more than 100 so the excess moisture it leaves out from its uh, control volume so that is what is called rain so when it rains in the nature what is actually happening is the <coughs> air in the atmosphere is changing its temperature from higher to lower level when the temperature comes down the moisture it is carrying falls down as rain this is what is the true definition of rain it's not that from ocean it is bringing moisture and suddenly pouring it the air is uh, the moisture is brought by the wind and that air parcel if it cools down <coughs> the air the moisture falls down as rain so <coughs> the question that comes next question why atmospheric temperature changes high in the at, no, uh, at a higher altitude now this phenomenon needs to be understood if we want to go uh, further in further details 
So I will show you an example. Here is an example of perfume. Why we feel cold when perfume is sprayed on skin? All of you must have experienced it. If you take out the perfume bottle from the Almira, it's not cold. It's not cold. It's at room temperature. The moment you press the button, push the button, it sprays out perfume besides giving a uh, good uh, fragrance. It also uh, reduces, if, if we hit it on our hand or skin, the temperature, we feel the cold. We feel a very cool breeze. How it happens? Let's understand this phenomena. This will help us understand how rain takes place. Or how the te temperature of the atmosphere comes down, which leads to rain. Now, what is happening in this case is, <coughs> let's see very precisely, the bottle contains, the perfume bottle contains liquid. Liquid means the molecules of perfume they are very close to heat each other. Okay. What we do, the bottle is pressurized. When we press the knob, what it does, it allows the, the liquid content to come out. The bottle is pressurized. Pressurized means its pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure. Now, when the liquid comes out, it is experienced lower atmospheric pressure. It is experiencing pressure relatively less than what is inside the bottle. Now, at lesser atmospheric pressure, what will happen? All the particles will go away from each other. It's something just like uh, in a school, if you remember, all students are standing inside and as soon as the gates are opened in the evening, three or four o'clock and the school is close, all students move out and suddenly spreads in all directions. Imagine the same situation. The bottle is containing liquid in an orderly manner. The moment it is brought into an atmosphere which is at relatively lower pressure, the molecule will go away from each other. Now, this is the point where you have to be little atten attentive. When the molecule of perfume moves away from each other, what it is doing? It is doing some work in thermodynamics. In second or third year, you will read the subject. Then the molecules are going away from each other. It is doing some work. And for doing this work, it requires energy. And from where it will draw energy? It will draw energy from its surrounding. And how it will draw its energy? It will reduce the temperature. It will take up heat from the surrounding and then as a result, the temperature falls down. Now, let us simulate the situation for atmosphere <clears throat> or to say the cloud, the ocean, water molecule or moisture from the ocean. When it moves up in a sunny day, it moves up go under the effect of wind. It moves towards the land surface. For some reason, if pressure is reduced for that air parcel, what will happen? The moisture, the molecules of uh, water, they will go away from each other because suddenly pressure has come down. And when it expands, it will cool down as in the same case. It will take uh, heat energy from the surrounding. Its temperature will come down the moisture holding capacity of that atmosphere will come down and suddenly rain takes place. So here the question, next question that arises is how the pressure comes down that causes lowering the temperature. So one of the example I have written here, orographic precipitation phenomena. So when the cloud moves and hits a where any mountain, so it does not actually hit the mountain. Mountains are very smooth, uh, gently move, uh, uh, rising surfaces. So a wind comes and simply glides over to the mountain. When it moves out up in the upper atmosphere, the pressure is less. So the same cloud experiences lesser pressure 
and when it experiences lesser pressure the same phenomena which i explained so far that is moving away of particles more, more water molecules uh, lowering of temperature followed by condensation of rain this is one way so this is what is orographic precipitation another cause of movement is suppose at day time the sun rise causes surf uh, ground earth surface to be very hot hot surface what it does it causes <coughs> vertical convection so the air parcel near the atmosphere it moves up in the vertical direction and it goes into the layer where the pressure is less and as the air pressure the air layer uh, containing moisture moves up to region where the pressure is less it expands and causes rain the <coughs> now this part you need to read again and again to understand this concept clearly this is uh, i am mentioning here the water cycle so this, this is how from uh, the water body the condense the lifting up of uh, water takes place through evaporation goes uh, to the higher altitude where it encounters low pressure region and then it spreads and during because of the spread its temperature comes down and then precipitation takes place again the same phenomena to some pictorial way from water body it's moving up when the sun rises there it moves horizontally under the impact of wind rising cooling subsequent rain so this is what it is hydrologic cycle now one question why desert on earth if you understand this a few claims that i will convert desert into a green forest you will i don't say stop but you will understand the limitations what are the limitations how much energy you have to feed to retain one desert into a lush green forest energy means money time resources everything so here i am trying to give, show it through uh, some pictorial representation you see <clears throat> what i am trying to show here is this is a wide canal okay water it's carrying water this is for you to understand the phenomena what happens in the atmosphere here is a wide canal water is flowing at a very high speed now if you draw the pressure uh, the water velocity profile across this Uh, canal you will see maximum velocity of water is at the center and as you go towards the bank of the canal water canning canal the velocity gradually comes down this is due to effect of friction or the boundary wall effect uh, those who will study fluid mechanics they will understand it now, now suppose you put a Uh, rubber uh, air filled rubber tube or say truck tire tires tube large in size visible you fill it with air and leave it on the <coughs> uh, this uh, canal what will happen this will move in the forward direction at the same time it will spin remember this word it will spin why it will spin because this tire this tube across its diameter faces two different velocities on the mid uh, at the towards the center of the canal the velocity is high whereas towards the bank the velocity is less this high and low velocity creates a couple and this starts spinning this that phenomena uh, happens in atmosphere also <coughs> okay let's see here how now this is a uh, this i am trying to show as the uh, this circle or ellipse is atmosphere uh, earth the central line is the equator the middle uh, um, the second line is the line of cancer in the northern hemisphere now let us see some of the speeds <coughs> well known speed jet plane speed is 850 km per hour sound speed 
and earth's rotation is 1750 km per hour this is uh, why it is shown for you to understand if i just write earth's rotation it, you won't get that relative feeling how earth is spinning at a speed double the speed of the jet plane this is what i want to show here now what will happen <coughs> at the line of cancer here at the line of cancer the speed is half of this approximately <coughs> and at the poles the speed will be if if it, if it is actually pole it is spinning at this point so assume velocity is zero so from equator to pole velocity if we assume gradually varying at the uh, line of cancer velocity will be 50% of the equatorial velocity now if any object kept between equator and line of cancer what will happen this object will experience two different velocities here what is the object the object is air parcel because earth is covered with air so the uh, air is experiencing different velocity at the equator and at the line of cancer what it will cause it will cause spinning of air parcel between equator and line of cancer can you sense this once again this phenomena actually takes place now what it does in what way this phenomena bring some change in our nature so now you see uh, uh, okay this is a better diagram or from here i'll start and then shift to the second one if you see this central portion this is equatorial area <clears throat> from here because of the strong and direct sunlight the evaporation of ocean water takes place it moves up and once it moves up you see this diagram is different here is the equator equator okay in this direction we are going towards north pole the other half is south pole so i have not drawn the south pole side only north pole side uh, towards north pole when the water molecule or moisture gets evaporated at the equator it moves up at the equator at higher latitude the in the level in the atmosphere it experiences low pressure because away from the atmosphere the pressure is low it expands and it when it expands it cools down it causes precipitation and rain takes place here at equator so the equator uh, if you study brazil amazon forest it's an equatorial forest <coughs> rain forest always continuously rain takes place there because this is the phenomena that is taking place now this air which has moved from equator or surface towards the upper level it expands now when it expands and leaves its moisture what is left is the dry air now please recall my previous slides <coughs> what is left here is dry air at higher levels now what happens it has a spread and then because it is dry it will come down relatively heavier than the wet air the dry air will come down so this is what is called headley cell from equator the wet air moves up at the top dry air is spreading and falling down at 30 degree north now what happens this has fallen down now if you can see you recall this there is one phenomena of this is spinning so the again this spinning takes place the dry air from the 30 degree north latitudinal region comes towards the equator so when dry air comes it will pick up moisture from that region and because of that phenomena the region becomes desert <clears throat> you see this diagram this will make it very clear the moisture laden uh, warm 
air moves from this equatorial line in the vertical direction at higher levels it uh, causes rain precipitation it spreads out in the north and southern direction hemisphere and in the if we think of northern hemisphere the dry air comes falls down at the ground surface and again moves towards the equator so when it moves it carries away the moisture which causes formation of desert drying up of that area and this is the reason you can see from equator at equal distance on north and southern hemisphere on towards the western side there are all deserts you see australia this is desert <coughs> south africa south america here in the northern <coughs> uh, hemisphere this entire peak, patch sahara indian registan here in the us this area is also desert so now sh you should be able to understand the reasons for formation of desert now if this, this is a desert it is a natural phenomena if you attempt feeding moisture into this area <coughs> to make it green what will you do in that process the next batch of dry air will come and suck all the moisture from that area and therefore you will not be left with moisture it's a natural phenomenon you can take a very small part and feed regularly water there but in the entire area you cannot make lush green because this is a natural global phenomena which you cannot change now <clears throat> uh, dr adhikari how much time do i have it seems i have consumed one hour can you help me understand <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Generally, we are for an hour, but uh, if you think um, ten minutes more, you can proceed. No problem. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So uh, I'll uh, move faster or take it in subsequent sections. Uh, our lectures, whenever in future, I'll take. <clears throat> but I want to go gradually so that the subject is understood clearly. so i think by now you must have got some idea about how the formation of desert takes place now <clears throat> we need to understand why life exists on earth or what is the cause of life now here i have shown you the area where this is red patch is desert remaining area is relatively green then there is land there is water again here you see there is warm water and cold water this causes flow of ocean uh, water this causes current formation so the cause of current uh, water current formation in ocean is warm water and cold water okay suppose the entire ocean water is of the same temperature the flow of water will cease so there is uh, the temperature difference of ocean water causes its flow <coughs> here the earth is inclined by 23 and 1/2 degree so the solar insulation is not equal from northern hemisphere is not pole to south pole then the movement of earth around the sun is not in circular orbit it's a elliptical orbit and again so here what we need to understand is there is a time when sun is close there is a time when sun is um, away so this causes season so one in the in the first slide i said we need to understand how seasons are formed so how many asymmetries are there asymmetry existence of life on earth is because of the asymmetry of the earth <coughs> earth is not a perfect sphere it's an oblong or oblate spheroid the difference in diameter is 42 km earth axis is tilted by 23 and a half earth does not rotate in circle instead an elliptical path 60% of southern hemisphere is water and 40% land and vice versa <clears throat> the land is covered by vegetation and desert so now you see the life exists or ecosystem exists because of asymmetry 
Now, if you want to copy it in your personal life, uh, you can think of why to marry the <laughs> man or woman of the same language, so in caste. <laughs> this asymmetry is bringing diversity in our country. <laughs> So you can simulate these things, existence of life. You go to America, there they talk of Africans and Americans and now Afro-Americans. So this is what is the cause of life, not only in Earth, but also in the society. <coughs> uh, here I will not, uh, this I am stopping for the uh, next uh, session. The question you can note down, what is the temperature beyond ionosphere or far away from the earth. What is the temperature? If this is the total universe, sun is here, uh, earth is here, okay. These things are all about the history of uh, air pollution. I'll take you to the last slide, okay. Here is the last slide. <coughs> June 5, 1972, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Many countries gathered to discuss air pollution issue, an international problem between United Kingdom and Scandinavian countries. Sweden is one of them. And their problem was, the complaint of Sweden was, the or the Scandinavian country was, they are losing green forest due to particulate matter and sulfur dioxide from United Kingdom power plants. And then they went to international court and uh, after this June 5th meeting, they came out with United Nations Environment Program. And they defined air pollution as transfer of harmful natural and or synthetic material into the atmosphere as direct indirect consequence of human activity. And that's the reason why June 5th is celebrated as Environment Day. So June 5, 1972, the meeting led to Environment Day and here is the definition of air pollution. But the causes of air pollution, you need to understand very carefully because there is a sequence and this will help us understand in future how we should be careful. Here, these are all slides for those. What are the industrial changes that uh, has taken place leading to uh, air pollution or air pollution problem today. I think uh, I should stop it now. If you have any query question, you can raise it now or tell me. I'll try to respond to you. Thank you, sir. That, yeah. that was an excellent talk and seems like I was the student and I do mean it because so many things learned about uh, is it those uh, circle or the rotation you have shown uh, in the difference in the airflow related with the cyclone that happens with that one? Okay, <clears throat> the uh, one phenomena that we need to understand about cyclone, the direction of spinning of cyclone in northern hemisphere is reverse of what is in southern hemisphere. So if you have a cyclone in the in Australian continent, its direction of spinning is different in above equator, means towards India or Northern America, the spinning is different. And it is because of the, the canal which I had shown. That's the example to make you understand how the spinning takes place in North and Southern Hemisphere. The direction is fixed. Uh, Sir, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. It's there. Good evening, please, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Param, sir, head of the department. Uh, in fact, I learned so many things from uh, this uh, lecture, sir. Thanks. Really uh, wonderful one, sir. In fact, we read all the things in the book, but we we, we didn't connect all these things properly, sir. In fact, you taught yeah. me a lot of good things. It's really a uh, good lecture, sir. I tried to do it because I also studied everything in patches. So now I think it's if we connect it, it will go to students a bit easily. Yes, sir. You start from bank theory to current life. Yeah. 
something is still left uh, the industrial revolutions coal mining power plants that brings us to today's air pollution problem why there is problem in delhi ncr the stubble burning the is it really uh, it is sure that air pollution is because of stubble burning but if you go still uh, deep inside its economics the economics of selling basmati rice the, the economics of the putting cap on the uh, serving period of rice in punjab if they shift it the problem will solve so this is uh, how they are related to each other thank you sir i am leaving sir i have to catch the bus sir uh, <laughs> it's a really very excellent lecture sir sir if you don't mind if it is possible please can you share the slides sir for us sir i'll send it I'll send it Thank to you, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay, sir. Uh, uh, Sabil, sir, um, question from students. Yeah, there is a question. Uh, from Ashish Rao. Sir, dryness is also there in cold regions. Is it also from air pollution? Mm, I'm not able to get. Once again, please, question. Uh, you can find the questions in the question and answer in the section. Uh, the Ashish Rao asked, Sir, dryness is also there in cold regions. Uh -huh. Is it also from air pollution? Okay, okay. Now let me correct the question. The question is dryness in cold region. It's written, is it correct? dryness yeah. in cold region now is it due to air pollution no dryness is because of lack of moisture and why uh, lack of moisture because in cold region at low temperature atmosphere is having lesser capability to hold moisture so it drains out all moisture contained in it and air becomes dry and dry air is hungry Remember, dry air is hungry. So what it does, it will try to eat more moisture. If you want to experience it, when the atmosphere is dry, we will feel the lips, cheeks. In the childhood, I remember that was a phenomena in central India. We get uh, the, we always need to put uh, Vaseline or Boralin or something on our face during winter. Why? Because of low temperature, atmosphere is not able to hold more moisture. <coughs> so what it does, wherever it finds moisture, it tries to uh, suck it, but it cannot hold. So it precipitates, but from where it will suck, if you keep a pot of water, it will get uh, evaporated. If the atmosphere is uh, dry, if it is dry, it will try to suck. So it will try to suck moisture even from our lips and skin, so it bursts. But atmosphere cannot hold that much of moisture. Uh, low temperature air is dry and pollution has got nothing to do with it. Just remember, pollution has got nothing to do with it. Any confusion on this, please ask. Let me clarify on that. Because this phenomena needs to be understood very clearly. The uh, moisture, temperature of air, and there are a few more things. Wind chill effect uh, during winter, if the wind speed is high and it is cold, it will dry away heat from our body. So even if temperature is not that low, we will feel cold. So that's a wind chill phenomena, similarly heat wave phenomena. So there are a lot of phenomena, but they are not within the this course will gradually shift to air pollution component in the subsequent lectures. Yeah, please. Any other question? Sir, I do. Sir, I do. <laughs> yeah, please. Sir. One thing, one uh, thing added to that added. one, not added, I will say this is my query in a sense. So if uh, any kind of pollution in air is not related with dryness, as you're saying directly, but maybe indirectly they're connected as they're changing the temperature of the atmosphere. That can be okay. Changing temperature of atmosphere because of pollution means we are bringing some chemical species or physical entity 
into the atmosphere, then we call it pollution as per OECD definition. And that is that can that cause change in temperature? So it is only greenhouse gases. So there is a list of greenhouse gases starting from CO2 is the first one, then methane, then NO2, not NO2, N2O, then chlorofluorocarbons, carbon, carbon hexafluoride. So there is a series of uh, gases which uh, absorbs long wave radiation. Remember, long wave radiation, which is returning from the atmosphere, uh, from the ground surface, and then causes rise in the temperature. This is the only phenomena that happens globally. It's a large scale phenomena, nothing else. In small scale, it is not possible. Uh, uh, I can see another question. Paris has given pollution alert when the pollution level is around 140. However, in New Delhi, it's around 1400. So proper measures for reducing it. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> first thing is India, uh, when uh, we, not only India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, highly populated and poor countries. So other countries try to help us so that they will get more space in the heaven. That is one way of thinking. The other way is today, the poverty issue is solved by the World Bank. They feed money, not the people. So that's one way of thinking. Today, in the name of environment, we are advised by all developing countries. Whereas 50 years ago, they were the people who were polluting. Today, we are having bad name because our central northern India's stubble burning problem. Because that's too bad. <clears throat> Currently, if you go to Delhi, you can see sun with naked eye. The reason, let me explain that phenomena. The because of stubble burning. And uh, politically, you may see the chief minister of uh, Delhi, Haryana, and uh, Punjab. They may fight with each other that who is responsible for pollution. But as a scientist, we know. As a scientist, we know stubble burning is taking place. It is visible from satellite, large number. After three or four days, it travels up to. Uh, NCR region, North, uh, National Capital region. Now it carries the salts. Now which salt? Ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate. From there it comes after combustion, the secondary pollutant formation takes place. Secondary pollutant. Primary pollutant is something which is emitted from the fire. When it travels in the atmosphere, it changes its character two gases react and form particle. Now this particle is having tendency to absorb moisture. When it absorbs moisture, it swells. If its size exceeds or come close to the lambda or the wavelength of short wave, uh, the radiation that comes from the earth, the sun, it blocks those radiations. And that's the reason you can see the sun. We can see the outer circle of the sun because those tiny particles large in number between us and sun and the size is very small somewhere close to that lambda. Nanometer visible ra radiation uh, range is 400 to 700 nanometer. If this particle is of this range, it will help us see the sun. So pollution is there because of this long range transport. Here long range is actually three to four days or one week at the most from uh, not only Punjab, even from Pakistan, because they also have the same season, same agricultural pattern. From there it comes towards uh, this endogangetic plane. So it is there. And I'll, I think uh, your uh, next lecture will be more focused on uh, understanding and controlling this kind of pollution. So this question may be for more related to the next part, I believe. Uh, let me say about uh, controlling. Uh, if you talk of national capital regions, current northern Delhi's problem, <coughs> controlling means 
are we trying to say don't to go for parali burning or stubble burning that is one way to control once it is in the atmosphere once it has come in the atmosphere then forget it has come uh, in the atmosphere now you go inside the, your house or uh, even in delhi the indoor air pollution is much worse because there is no scope of ventilation <coughs> in that region so control is uh, one, usually control is thought of as industrial pollution control industrial pollution control means in a power plant after the furnace and boiler assembly when the flue gas moves out towards the stack it contains ply ash a part of which is collected using electrostatic precipitator in the control esp control unit that's a control unit that's purely mechanical electrical and electronic in your the three guns and civil engineer to erect it their role in that direction so that is the control inside the industrial uh, domain that is one way of control the other way of control is actually in the case of this parali burning or stubble burning is changing the economics or changing the ground water usage pattern so uh, that will be talked separately and i'll explain on those in future uh, i'll take to you gradually from uh, this subject towards air pollution okay absolutely sir sir is it okay for uh, another couple of questions please please no issues i am here for that okay um well uh, as we know moisture conversions is more on the southern side of india so does it affect the northern part of india by applying the same concept of formation of deserts mm -hmm. okay uh, the words in the question is jumbled or play somehow the the one who wants to uh, put his uh, who put this question he has some queries now let me give clarity the rain in southern india particularly kerala that's entirely because of some different phenomena and the rain in the other central indian part is because of different thing now what is that difference in kerala see there is one uh, hill uh, range that travels from gujarat towards maharashtra okay pune it goes towards um, goa karnatak uh, part of very small patch of tamil nadu kerala up to kanyakumari there is a hill range the range of okay which is now called silent valley where tamil nadu kerala and uh, karnataka all the three states meet now this uh, that particular region is called rain forest why because six months not in gujarat kerala side six months rain takes place even today yesterday it's raining there now what, what the what is the cause of rain there that is orographic precipitation orographic means because there is a hill range the uh, moisture laden air comes hits the uh, this uh, hilly range so it doesn't hit it moves up and when it moves up it takes up the moisture it uh, goes into the higher layers where the pressure is low so it expands and causes rain so kerala is a rain forest so the you if you can see the produce masala and all kinds of the biodiversity of that region is somewhat similar to brazil because brazil is also a rain forest you can uh, bring some seeds from janjivar or brazil and uh, soil in kerala it will grow but if you bring it in madhya pradesh it will not grow so that patch is having a different reason for rain the <coughs> question was central india the reason is different the uh, because of the hot summer vertical convection takes place so it causes uh, moisture laden air to move up and it re reaches a layer where it expands cools down humidity uh, moisture capacity the rh goes beyond 100 and precipitation the so cause of rain in india are two different if you go to uh, uh, seven sisters of east reason is different the hilly area is having orographic precipitation that is the reason 
So uh, I'm not sure whether I have answered the question put by the student, but I feel that his question was South Indian rain and North Indian rain. So this is the difference. Uh, can rain reduces air pollution? Can rain reduces air pollution? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> suppose we are having dust on your body. What you do? You take shower, so it clears you. So atmosphere is also having dust. If you uh, drop some water, it will uh, remove the moisture uh, dust. So that will certainly remove the uh, pollutant from the atmosphere. But in this context, one more new thing to learn. And that new thing is, what is the pH of rainwater? <coughs> All students should know. What is the pH of rainwater? Go through Google and keep the answer ready. Remember, neutral water is having a pH of 7. The double distilled water may have a pH of 7. Can what can be the pH of rainwater? Will it be seven or eight or five or six? Now remember one thing: in the atmosphere there is carbon dioxide. Rainwater it absorbs carbon dioxide. It forms carbonic acid. And once it is acid, it releases H plus. So pH will come down. So now you tell me, pure rainwater is acidic. It is not neutral water. It is acidic because it contains it contains carbonic acid. So in equilibrium with atmospheric carbon dioxide, rainwater is having pH below six. It is something like 5.4 or 5.6. So let this be an assignment for students. Let them search and give the answer to you. What is the rainwater pH in perfect equilibrium with atmospheric CO2? <coughs> Another question, uh, I don't know how much is related. Is air pollution has any effect on our memory? That's what student asked. Like, okay. like serious um, brain effect from air pollution. Is there any kind of study on that? Okay, okay. let me try to answer. Uh, effect of air pollution on memory. Now, when you say memory, <clears throat> something like Alzheimer's that causes uh, loss of memory. It happens at late age, six, 60, 70. When people do something nasty at 60, we say Satya Gaya. Actual meaning is he has crossed 60, 60 saal cross ho gaya. So we say Satya Gaya. Hai. But that's a uh, Muhavra. Or kahavats, but actual meaning is by that age, some of our neurons that loses memory, loses some of the stored memory, and therefore that acts. Now, if they because of air pollution, if those neurons get disturbed, that is uh, certainly it's going to be. We can say yes, it has caused memory, but in, in young age, don't. If you are not able to answer your questions in the exam, don't say it is air pollution. Because that much of air pollution, it requires a pretty long time. That much of load into our system that will harm your neurons. At this age, you're perfectly all right. We are not living in that poor air. Uh, one uh, one. One last question. Uh, it's a very general question by one student. Uh, what's the solution for air pollution? OK, uh, yeah, some 25 or 30 years ago, one of the quote given in the textbook is for uh, dilution is the solution to water pollution. Dilution is the solution to water pollution, only water pollution. Now, how dilution? If you have a small amount of highly polluted wastewater, what you do, you throw it in the river. River is having very large amount of water, so it will dilute to the extent that it doesn't affect the uh, aquatic ecosystem. Remember, to the 
uh, you can throw only that much of waste water into water body to the extent it doesn't affect or impact adversely the aquatic ecosystem till then dilution is the solution but as far as air is concerned it is not dilution here the word used is assimilative capacity of air assimilative capacity means suppose uh, in your city there are roads which is having fast moving vehicles now you have the option you can use bs3 vehicle bs4 vehicle bs6 vehicle now here comes the role of assimilative capacity or even electric buses or electric cars so if you think of old uh, 30 year old vehicles you fill or replace all the current number of vehicles with those old vehicles which were having very engine which used to generate directly emit everything without any control or catalytic converter in that case today we will be choked why because large number of vehicles we have wider roads but the vehicles are of older technology so what we did gradually policy have come and new engines have come so earlier it was bs3 bharat stage 3 equivalent to european norms they have euro 3 euro 4 euro 6 so we simply copy from we replace euro and put the word bs bharat stage 3 4 6 currently it is 6 so when it was bs3 but same number of vehicle same number so what will happen the load is very high because engines are not that good then comes bs4 so it is less polluting now bs6 it is relatively much less polluting but now what is happening we are gradually increasing our road width increasing the speed so number of vehicles are going so here it is not the dilution it is the assimilative capacity how to adjust it? we should reduce the load into the atmosphere how we reduce the load in uh, of pollutant into the atmosphere by shifting from bharat stage 3 to 4 to 6 there is no bharat stage 5 from 4 we have directly gone to stage 6 and the question is are we prepared for that level of bs 6 because if you go to some rural area or semi urban area you will find auto rickshaws with uh, where petrol is mixed with kerosene now those who are making rules for those uh, the auto rickshaw fellow they say it is wrong they should be penalized they should be checked but and one more thing if an auto fellow have the option of running the vehicle with an adulterated fuel why he should think of this pollution air pollution <coughs> his primary need is his pet his family his food clothing and shelter so when we take such decision in environment socio economic component comes into play there we should be cautious and we should consider those things this is what is my suggestion <coughs> no voice no voice i i say the yeah. last question but i think uh, uh, a question came i think so i'm considering this one as the last one um there's project sir where there are big fans uh, which can take air and separate carbon dioxide and release oxygen into the air actually i think i have seen that project i think i'm not i may not be sure but probably in dubai or those rich countries i think they are trying to imply some machines where they will constantly collect uh, or basically filter co2 uh, out from the air so i think this question is related to that how much useful are those you think uh, okay let me correct uh, a part of this question the fan <clears throat> what fan can do is it will suck air and then it must be having some control unit where it will do some physical chemical changes and throw out clean air okay in this process it is not possible that it will suck co2 because atmosphere contains co2 how much 0.033% if you can recall okay and it will suck atmospheric air so its role should be only to remove primarily particulate matter 
I have not yet talked of particulate matter or the pollution types. I will come. Uh, I mean, even in the next lecture, I may not be able to reach up to particulate matter because there is a wide gap. We have to go gradually. So, in if you have seen it in Middle East or in West Asia, some people say it is actually sucking the atmospheric air, removing the particulate matter and throwing it out the clean air. That's the only phenomena. Here comes the question: What is the volume of the atmosphere? How much air you are drawing in, how much you are throwing out. What is the efficiency of that system or effectiveness? Remember the two words. Efficiency of that control fan, uh, filter assembly, assume it as 100%. It is taking and removing everything. Now effectiveness. So what you are doing in the entire atmosphere, you are taking a part of it, cleaning it and mixing it back into the atmosphere. So what is the effectiveness that you need to calculate the ratio or the percentage, how much of this entire atmosphere, how much percentage of fraction you are cleaning. That's how and assume that the, your engine is working at 100% efficiency. Will it be effective? So here the law changes. The scale of pollution, the magnitude of pollution that we need to understand. Anything else? We'll stop here and I'll yeah. uh, Prusti sir, Samaganta Prusti sir. Uh, so respected invited speaker, Dr. K.V. George sir, and dear faculty friends and dear students, a very good evening to everyone. So just now we experienced a, an excellent lecture by our invited expert, Dr. K.V. George sir, who gave a broad ideas about AR basically and its pollution. So probably he will be giving the next lecture on how to, I mean, remediate that one. So in his lecture, he spoke about the evolution of Earth, evolution of atmosphere, direction of the air that leads to the formation of desert and Earth and cyclone, etc. So he gave some examples of day-to-day -day happenings uh, and how they are related to atmospheric change, which made the lectures more interesting. And I'm very sure all of our students must have enjoyed every moment of her lecture, sir. So on the behalf of the Department of Chemistry, VIPF University, I sincerely thank uh, to Dr. K.V. George, sir, for sparing some time with us and from his busy schedule and sharing his knowledge with us. I too sincerely thanks to the organizers, especially Dr. Shabil, sir, Dr. Anubendu, sir, for organizing this live event. And I also truly thank to our students for attending the live event. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir.